I want to invite you to be a part of something very exciting. We believe that God has called Life Fellowship Church to plant our second campus in Anna, Texas. Listen, everybody, together we are going to shine the light and love of Jesus in this community and beyond. Um, Life Fellowship, it means a lot to me. I've been passively been going to for about 10 years, and about two years ago, I gave my life to Christ. God's really been using Life Fellowship to help redeem parts of my story by serving others. Yeah, Life Fellowship to me, what it means to me is it's home. A life Fellowship uh, means to me uh, just excitement, enthusiasm, and um, one that looks to uh, really have a significant impact on the next generation. Hello everyone, I'm John, I'm the Anna Campus Pastor. My wife Jen and I have lived in Anna for over eight years. We know the firemen, the police officers, the restaurant owners in the area. We love Anna and we love the surrounding community and we know God loves them too. Well, John, I love that guy. Um, I get the honor of calling John one of my friends and uh, one of my brothers. I think um, Pastor John was the first pastor we met, the first person that reached out to us when we decided to start coming to the Life Fellowship. He has had a huge impact in our life from praying with us through being through our life obstacles, like we we're going through fertility, and he was with us, praying with us, you know. Um. You know, there's a genuineness about John. When you talk to him, you know you don't feel, you know you're important to him. And he understands how to relate to people on the small hometown level and also to lead people on the world stage. And that is an amazing combination. And he's goofy, and I'm goofy, which I love. Every time we walk into Life Fellowship, the first person we see is Pastor John welcoming us with a huge smile on his face. And when he's not there, it makes a huge difference. Did you know that the city of Anna is the ninth fastest growing community in all of North Texas? Right now, 25,000 people live in this city and it's expected to mushroom to over 100,000 people by the year 2040. And many of these people are hurting. They're without Christ. They're looking for answers. They're looking for hope. Life Fellowship coming to Anna is, uh, it's an opportunity. Life Fellowship's so good at attracting just all ages and diversity. The people of Anna are amazing. I'm really excited to reconnect to the place where the Lord so clearly spoke to me. Our city needs Jesus, the one who changed our lives. Would you join us in planting a life-giving church that is gonna reach Anna and beyond? Kids program isn't an afterthought. It's a completely different movement. It's a movement all up in its own. My little five-year-old is praying over my three-year-old the other day because he was sick. So she came up and put her hands on him and said, we're gonna pray over this sickness. You know, I work in a school system and um, more than just reading and writing, our kids need to know the gospel of Jesus Christ. Count me in. Count me in. Count me in. Count me in. Well, hey, everybody, good to have you in service with us today. We are in week number one of a four part message series that we've entitled Exponential. I'll tell you more about that here in just one second. But first of all, as always, want to say a big hello to our church online family and all of our men and women in every single department of corrections around America. Can you one last time give a great, big, warm welcome to every single one of them today? God bless you guys. Well, today is going to be a very unique message. It's going to be very different than what I typically bring to you on a normal weekend because we are going to take a journey as we go into really stepping into what God has for us in launching this second campus in Anna. And I believe that today's message is going to galvanize our hearts together. It is going to inspire us. And I believe it's going to stir our faith both corporately and in your life individually. Whether you're online, in the correctional facilities, God's going to do something very, very special. And before I even go any farther into this message, I just want to say that to God and God alone 
belongs all the glory for everything that is happening here. You know, when I see what is taking place here, it doesn't cause me to kind of stick out my chest and go, wow, look at how cool we are. It actually does the opposite. It drives me to my knees in humility because to whom much is given, much is gonna be required of them someday. In fact, I'll, I'll, I'll say it like this. We are not a great church. We just happen to serve a great God. That's what it is. Honestly, we, we feel like that turtle on the fence post. You know what I'm saying? That, that turtle knows he didn't get there by himself. Somebody else placed him there. And we know that God is the one that is orchestrating and doing what we are experiencing right now. And God is using every single one of you to build his church. Every one of you that serve and give and pray and God is blessing it in massive ways. In fact, the Bible says in the book of Ephesians, Paul writes, he said, God is building a home. And he's using all of you. Those of you in the correctional facilities, he's using all of us. Irrespective of how we got here, and it's interesting to me how many stories I hear of how God actually had to move you across the country to get to be a part of what's going on here. And what he's building, he's used the apostles, the prophets for the foundation, now he's using you, fitting you in brick by brick, stone by stone with Christ Jesus as the cornerstone that holds all of the parts, like every one of us together. And we see it taking shape day after day, a holy temple built by God. All of us, all of us built into it, a temple in which God is quite at home. And you know, when I think about our future, we're doing a lot, but God's involved in it, and he is blessing things that, uh, and bringing an ease to things that typically would be very difficult. And when I think about the results, you know, there's a tendency in all of us to just see the numbers, but it's, it's my prayer that behind every number, we would see a hurting, wounding person that came home to find Jesus, came home to find freedom. And I'm really praying, I'm hoping that all of us are going to capture the same passion that I know that Jesus has for the church, because I don't think that he sees it in the terms of, well, how many campuses are we launching, and how many buildings do we have, and how many services, and life groups, and programs, and events, and on and on. I just think that he looks out and he sees this world and he sees his wandering lost kids. And he needs a vehicle for them to be able to find him. And the only thing that he has ever come up with, the only thing that he has ever created to do this is the local church. And so because of that, we can't just be about launching campuses and building buildings and offering more services and events and programming because, oh man, that's what we're supposed to do as a church. No, it's, we need to be about creating a place that people can come just like they are with all their problems and questions and some loose screws issues, and they can find a place to belong. They can find a place of healing. They can find a place of freedom. They can find Jesus. And as your pastor, I'm going to tell you that one of the questions that I, I live out every day is, God, what is next? Who else are you positioning us to reach? Because I'm going to tell you something. This room is filled with, those of you online, those of you in correctional facilities, this church is filled with leaders. And the thing about a leader is that we cannot just look in this moment right now in this present and just, no, no, no. We have to look two years, three years, five years down the road. Where are we going to be as a church? We've got to have space for your family, for your friends, for, for your kids. But it's more than that. Right now, all of Dallas is moving north. The city of Anna is right now the ninth fastest growing city in all of North Texas. Since the year 2000, it has grown by 1,915%. 
By the year 2040, it is expected to mushroom from the 25,000 people that live there to over 100,000 people. The Anna ISD right now has 5,000 children, and it's expected to grow by 2040 to over 20,000. Texas Instruments has, uh, is building a $30 billion campus just south of Sherman that's bringing in 6,000 new jobs. Like, there is incredible momentum happening in that way, and I could talk to you all day long about the economic development and what is taking place, but as a Christ follower, I think we need to be even more focused in on what is happening spiritually. According to the Precept Group, there are 225,000 people that live within a 10-mile radius of Anna. 225,000. But right now, this weekend, only 31,000, or 14% of them, are going to be in church on any given weekend. So I want you to think about that number, 14%. Can I remind you today that we are not living in a Christian nation anymore? This is a post-Christian nation. It is the third largest unreached people group on the planet, America. That means that this weekend, 194,000 people are going to be away from church which most likely means this, if they're away from church, there's a strong tendency that they could be away from God. So let me tell you the story of Anna. So it was last Easter, as we just opened up the new expansion to this building, we launched the fourth service. And, I mean, we had an influx of all kinds of people, and I began to sense in my heart that, my goodness, we've gotta be prepared to launch a second campus. So it was last year now at this exact time that I was with my elder team. We went away to pray and to fast for the the direction of God and it became abundantly clear unanimously to all of us to move forward to launch a second campus in Anna, Texas. So for the next nine months after that, we did our due diligence. I mean, we prayed, we fasted, we met with leaders, We actually had some incredibly talented technology folks in the church that helped uh, create uh, a -a one-of-a-kind, unique, uh, uh, predictive analytic software program that we plugged in all kinds of data, and we got all the demographics and where where people are moving to and what it's going to look like in five years, three years, ten years from now, and, and it all confirmed that Anna was the place where God was calling us to plant. So it was June 20th of this year. Summer had just kicked off. It was a Tuesday morning. I was in my office, 1030. I will never forget that day. Because I was praying over this Anna campus. I was saying, God, just please help us. Give us your wisdom. Tell us kind of what to do and when we're supposed to move forward. And all of a sudden, and that's the best word I can say, it's suddenly like the Lord stepped into my office like in such a powerful way. And he brought me to this verse in Exodus that says this, then the Lord said to Moses, why do you keep praying about this? Why do you keep crying out to me? Tell the people to get moving. And when I, I'm just gonna tell you, I sat there and literally was shaking in the presence of God. And the Lord deposited on the inside of me a spirit of faith, like great faith, bold faith. And it was what I had been waiting for this whole time. Because let me tell you something. Anytime that you take new ground, Anytime that you take new territory for God, you will face new giants. You will face new opposition. You're going to face bigger attacks than you ever dreamed possible coming in your life. And I'm going to tell you, I'm, I'm very accustomed to the attacks, very accustomed to the opposition. And the Lord knew that I needed this. I remember after that happened, and I burst into the offices. We're all, we have open offices. I burst into the offices. I'm like, hey, guys, bring it on in. 
I said, God just spoke to me. It was the most incredible thing. I'm literally shaking. I'm like, guys, write this date down. Like God, you're, you're, God is giving us a new story he's gonna write. We're gonna move forward with strength. I wish I could tell you what it is that God told me, but I can't. It's too fresh on the inside of me. But just mark this day down. The very next day, I called up my friend David Craig. I said, hey, David, do you happen to know the mayor of Anna? And I said, man, I would really love his support in us launching this second campus. And I, I could almost hear David, uh, on, he was almost chuckling, laughing on the other side of the phone. He's like, Chris. He like, not only do I know him, he like one of my good friends. He's an incredible Christ follower. He said, I promise you, he will give 100% support behind this. And come to find out, the Anna mayor just said to me recently, he just said, Chris, I'm asking you, I am begging you, we need a church like Life Fellowship to be an Anna more than ever before. We need help because we need people to come find Jesus. It was incredible. So the week after that, I am... After our fourth service on a Sunday, I was out in the lobby, and there's a lady in our church that is one of the leaders in the Plano ISD. And I came to her, and I said, hey, do you think you could help me out? Do you know anybody in the Anna ISD that could help us to get into a school? So here's the thing you need to know about Anna. Anna is so fresh, so young, that there's not a hotel there. There's not convention centers there. The only place for a church to be able to meet is in, a, is in a, 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 a local school. And I had my heart set on the high school. But I had heard that it was very difficult to get into the school, the, to the high school. She said, actually, I know somebody. She is the assistant superintendent of the Anna ISD. Her name is Dr. Gail Smith. She's an incredible Christ follower. Let me text her the Life Fellowship story and ask her if she would help. So she texts her. Almost immediately, Dr. Smith writes back and says, oh my goodness, this morning my husband and I were praying that God would send a life-giving church to Anna, Texas that would help reach the next generation. And then I get this text from you. She said, God's answering my prayer. Yes, I will do whatever I can to help make that way take place for you. I will do whatever I can. So the very next morning, I texted Dr. Gail Smith, and I said, Dr. Smith, I said, you are my Esther. God has you there for such a time as this. I didn't know this until afterwards. But when she got that text, she actually got so excited, so emotional, she had to leave the meeting because, you ready for this? That morning... She was praying to the Lord in her time with Jesus. She said, oh, Jesus, please make me an Esther. Four hours later, I text her and say, you are my Esther. She said, I'm all in. I'm all in. Two weeks later, I'm sitting down with the superintendent of the Anna ISD, Dr. Como, and we finished up our lunch, shaking hands. He says, I'm approving you to step into the Anna High School. And I just, I just, I looked at Dr. Como. I told him, I said, sir, let me tell you something about our church. You will never add more value to us than we add to you. We will always be people that will add more. I said, we are gonna love that school like none else. I said, every single month, we're gonna bring in Chick-fil-A for the entire school faculty. I'm gonna bless the fire out of your teachers. We're gonna so love the, the students of that school that if there ever happens to be a tragedy, your principal will want to reach out to us first because we have a, such a heartbeat connecting with the students and with the teachers. We're gonna be on the football field. We wanna love the students. We wanna love the faculty. We're gonna love this city. Ladies and gentlemen, God is bringing us incredible doors of opportunity. And we believe around here that God opens the doors 
And it's our responsibility to take the step of faith and to walk through that door. It's our responsibility to do that. Listen, 75,000 people are going to move into Anna in the next 16 years. And let me just say this, because I know that there are many of you that you, you, you come in from that area of North Dallas, and you don't mind driving 30 minutes to come to service, but I'll tell you what, they're not going to drive 30 minutes. They want to attend church in the same city that their kids attend school. They want to attend church in the same city that they love. So I've got great news for you today. Right now, we have 225 people from Life Fellowship that live in the Anna area, which is what you need to create a thriving, incredibly flourishing church that is going to reach this area and beyond. And so let me kind of give you a bit of the launch plan. So our goal, our objective is, is that in August of 2024, we're going to launch with 500 people in two different services, a 9 and a 1030. And it's going to be the same uh, children's programming that we experience here as there. You're going to be shocked. You're going to be blown away how we're going to actually transform that uh, high school to look like a Life Fellowship campus. It's going to, it's going to shock you and the entire community. So, I, so the same worship team is going to be rotating between campuses, uh, same student ministry, life groups, pastoral care. We are going to make an, a difference. It is going to be a video teaching venue, which will provide me the opportunity to be able to go and love on and pray with and hang out. And God is going to do something so spectacular. Now, in order to launch this, Two things are going to need to take place. Number one, we have a launch budget of $500,000. And in order to do that, uh, these are funds that we're going to believe God is going to come in during our annual Christmas offering. And these, this, this half a million dollars is going to pay for the trailers, the equipment, the outreach, the, the marketing, the software, everything that we need to make a very uh, sharp approach and insert into that community in a massive way. The second thing is this, that in order for a church plant to survive and to thrive and to grow, the people that are which are going to be many of you, potentially, you need to know that you're not going to be in a set up and tear down mode indefinitely. Like people have to know that there's the hope of a future home, that we're not going to just always be church plant, but there's going to come a day we're going to be church planted. And so what we're going to do in this new year is that we're going to believe God that in the course of 2024, we're going to be able to raise $3 million so that we can buy land in a strategic location in Anna, Texas. And it's my prayer that we actually pay cash for this property. It's gonna be our promised land. It's gonna be the place that God uses to launch out into that area of North Dallas and beyond. And ladies and gentlemen, I want you to be reminded of what Jesus said in Luke chapter one, verse 37. He said, for nothing is impossible with God. And I'm asking you today to believe with me for the impossible. Now, there are three things that can stop the, the dream that God has given you from becoming a reality. So personally in your life, in your business, in your finances, in your marriage, your emotions, your, your parenting, your dream, your ministry. These are three things that will stop your dream dead. And these are three things that will also stop us corporately from stepping into and experiencing the dream that God has for us as a church. And the first one is is when we get a wrong view of life. And so for a lot of us, this life actually becomes a distraction for what God actually wants to do through you. In fact, let me say it like this. Um, Your reality is this reality. Like you're so focused on earth. You've got all your eggs in this basket called earth. 
And I'm here to remind you today, everybody, that you're not, this is not your home. You're just passing through. You have a different home. It's a place called heaven. It's a real place. It's the blessed, it's the blessed hope. And honestly, um, what I've noticed is that there's, there's been a number of people here recently that have kind of got bent out of shape because of all kinds of things that are happening in this life. You know, we, we look at the political chaos. We see the moral decay happening in this world and in America. You talk about COVID and the shootings in Maine. and I mean, you could just go on. And, and, and let me just say this. I'm not saying that we shouldn't be concerned. I'm not saying that we should not be aware of these things that are taking place. But what I am saying is that we shouldn't allow the world to pull us down into all this gloom, doom, and despair that's happening all around. Like, hey, everybody, as the church, this is our time to rise up and to be our best. Like, when the world is freaking out, we ain't. Like, we rise up. We're going to love people. In fact, for some of you, this is the word of the Lord for you today. And it's this, don't be nervous. Don't get nervous. Jesus said that in the last days, these things are gonna happen. Like there's gonna be calamity. And if you think it's gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna trend down, no, 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 there's gonna be an uptick of all of this stuff. And what the God of the universe is trying to do is he's trying to get you and I to become the salt and the light because light shines really good when things get dark all around. Honestly, the reason why so many people right now are very uncomfortable is because for the first time in hundreds and hundreds of years in America, Christians are now the minority. For the first time in hundreds of years, Christians are being censored and silenced. And for the first time, we're experiencing an a rise in persecution. And I just want to say it again. Persecution does not make me nervous at all. It never hurts the church. Never, never, never. It actually, the church thrives in the midst of persecution because when persecution comes against the church, man, that's when we plant our roots down deeper into the things that actually really matter. Hey, everybody, we're not gonna freak out like the world does. We're not gonna plant all our eggs in this place called earth. No, 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 we're gonna keep loving people. We're gonna keep doing what's right and we're gonna leave the results with God. Don't get nervous. Get your eyes off of this life here on this earth because you're just a blip passing through. Here's the second thing that will stop your dream from becoming a reality, and that's a wrong view of self. And there's some of you that are here today that you're actually thinking, you know what, Chris? Great for you. Love that the church is moving forward, taking new ground, but you have no idea what I've been through in my life. And if that's you, can I just say this to you as gently and as humbly as I possibly can? You're gonna need to let God heal you of that. You're gonna need to let the Lord reach his mighty strong hand down into the mud pit of your life and make your life great. You know, the Bible says in the book of Psalms 35 that God sees greatness in you that you don't even see in yourself. And I want to say this to all the men and women that are in the correctional facilities. I felt this so strongly yesterday as I was praying over this service. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter what's happened in your past. God still has a plan for your life. And God's going to use you right where you're at. And more than ever before, you're going to need to allow the great God of the universe to reach into your life and pull you out and to make your life great. There's destiny on your life. Destiny. See, the problem is, is that we don't see things as they are. We see things as we see ourselves. We don't see things as they are. We see things as we see ourselves. And that's why more than ever before, we need to begin to see ourselves the way that God sees us. I'm going to tell you, growing up, 
the enemy was writing a script for my life. He was trying to hijack it. I grew up every day. I heard from my mom, my mom and dad, I love you. I'm so proud of you. We're praying every single day of my life. But I was bullied all throughout elementary school and junior high. I mean, I'm the kid that worked really hard for my C's. I'm the C student from Wisconsin. Come on, where are my C people at? Come on, put your hands up. Come on, put it up. Put it up. Put it up. Put it up. Way up there. Yeah, I love you. This is my family right there. I love you all. This is is great. All right, y'all, all all you A people know you want to put your hand up too. Come on, where are my A people at? Come on, put it up. Come on, put it, just wave it. Come on, just, no, keep it up, keep it up, keep it up. In the correctional facility, come put it up. We don't like you. You guys are always messing up our curve, you know what I'm saying? Stay home. Y'all walk into class. I didn't even study for that test. I got myself an A. Man, I spent hours and hours. I mean, you guys are brilliant. It's like my son Nash. Brilliant. Like growing up. When he was growing up, all A's. All the time, all A's. He'd come home. He's like, hey, Dad, check out my, check out my report card. All A's. Never got a B in my whole life. I'm like, that ain't nothing, son. I ain't ever got to be in my whole life either, you know? (laughs) So hush. (laughs) I remember when I was at Bible college, man, I was paddling so hard to stay afloat. I got into my speech class, and I failed my speech class. And yet, look at what God is doing. Can I remind you today that you are not what you see when you look in the mirror? You are who God says that you are. The truest thing about you is not what other people say about you, not what you say about you, not what you think about you. The truest thing about you is what God says about you. Here's the third thing that will stop you from realizing your dream, and that's this, when you get a wrong view of God. And I want to remind you today that we serve an awesome, powerful, omnipotent, nothing is impossible with God. And it's time that we stop praying these weak, anemic prayers. Like, now I lay me down to sleep. Oh, I pray thee, Lord, thy soul to keep. And if I should die before I wake. How morbid of a prayer is that? Really? Really? We're going to pray that. What happened to a people that would rise up and say, God, I'm praying for a revival in Dallas, Texas. Why not here? Why not now? God, we claim Anna, Texas for your name. We pray, God, that in the name of Jesus, we're going to see the next generation come to know you as Savior and King. God, use us and do something historical through us in Jesus' mighty name that your name would be lifted up. God honors bold prayers because bold prayers honor God. I want, I don't know about you, I want to live a life so big that it can't possibly ever happen unless the God of the universe gets involved in it. I'm tired of dreaming such small dreams that it can be done with the, the exercise of man's in, intuition and our, our, our grit and our wisdom. Listen, we need to stop resting on our own experience and once again begin to rest on the mighty arm of a God that nothing is impossible. It says in Jeremiah, are you guys getting something out of this today? I'm fired up by it. Yeah. Ah, sovereign Lord, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arms. And I want you to know today, God, that I still believe that nothing is impossible for you. I'm challenging you today to once again believe for big, bold, audacious things from God. And so it's my honor today to be able to introduce to you our Seeds Vision campaign. And in your front seat back pocket, there's this little card 
And I'm going to ask everyone to please take this out. There's also a QR code if you'd like to look at this digitally for those of you that appreciate that instead. And I'm going to ask every person here to pray about making three commitments. To join with me in these three things. Number one, I'm going to ask you to join with me and commit to pray. Man, more than ever before, we need the leadership, the guidance, uh, the illumination of the path by the Holy Spirit. Number two, I'm going to ask you to commit to to give a one-time seeds offering. Listen, we only take two special offerings a year, one at Christmas, one at Easter. This is our, this is our Christmas offering. And it's a $600,000 offering, and the first 500,000 we're gonna use to help plant the church. It's the launch budget for, for Anna. The next 100,000 we're gonna use for some very crucial mission projects. And I'm gonna ask you to commit. It's not equal gifts, but it's equal sacrifice. And then the last thing is to commit to a one-year seeds pledge that over the course of this next year, beginning in January, above and beyond the tithe, that you would say, God, I want to return this to you. I want to give this because, Lord, I, just, I, I, I want to see a community reach for you. Like the time is now, leaders. And so let me tell you what Tatum and I are going to do. Because I believe that leaders always go first. And the only reason why I'm going to share this with you today is because the precedent is there in Scripture. When King David, when he built the temple, he got up and publicly declared to the people, hey, this is what I'm going to do. Not so that people can look at somebody, but it's, for one thing, just to set an example. So we're going we're gonna to first of all pray. We're going to fast. We've already been doing that. We're committing to do that. Number two, in this year-end one-time seeds offering, my wife and I are going to give a very significant gift that's above and beyond our tithe so that we can fund this Anna launch and touch the world in missions. And we're going to have to sacrifice. And sacrifice means this. I'm giving up something that I love or something that I love even more. We're going to have to say no to a number of different things. And that's okay. Because I'm not focused on this life. But the third thing is that we prayed about what God would have us to give in 2024. In fact, I told Tatum, I said, hey baby, you go pray and I'll pray. We'll come back together in a week and we'll find out. We'll, we'll compare numbers. Okay. Which by the way, whoever has the highest number, that's the one you always go with. All right. So. We came back after a week, and I said, hey, baby, what did God tell you? She said, no, I'm, I'm, I'm going first. You tell me what God told you. I said, no. I said, you go first. We shared it, and it was the exact same number. And so what Tatum and I are going to do above and beyond our tithe in, well, let me just say it like this, in 2024, 20, beginning in January, we're going to give 20% of everything that we make. We're going to return it to the house of the Lord our God. So everything from investments and dividends and other income and salary, everything. So the first 10%, we're going to return to the house of the Lord. That's our tithe. That's a non-negotiable. I mean, I don't need to, need to pray and ask God about that. That's what Scripture says. But then we're going, to, we're going to basically double our tithe. And we're going to add the next 10%, and we're going to give it so that we can establish it life-giving church in Anna that's going to reach so many people. Destiny is going to be changed. Missionaries are going to come out of that place. And we're committed. I got great news for you because while I was in India, there was a couple in our church that reached out to me. They said, Pastor Chris, we're so excited about this vision to go into Anna. And we want to be the very first people to vest financially into this and so we want to give an offering of matching funds of $1 million into the campaign. In other words, everybody, we're like, come on, somebody. Isn't that incredible? So, so we're like almost a third of the way there. 
Like we have an Anna Mayor that's opening up saying, please come. We have the superintendent and the assistant superintendent says, please come to this. We, we need your help reaching these kids. We have folks that are stepping up and recognizing the hand of God. And I say, why not now? That's why I'm asking you, friends, to pray about committing to make the most significant sacrificial gift and offering that you've ever made into God's work. And I'll say this to you. There will be no arm twisting. There will be no manipulation. I cast the vision four weeks in advance before the offering ever happens so that you can just do one thing. You don't have to feel pressure from me. I want to raise a body of believers here that you know how to listen to God and do what he says. And if we'll all do that, my goodness, we're going to see the victory. So there will be no sad stories. There's no, going to be no manipulation. There's going to be no arm twisting. I'm going to cast vision, give you a lot of space to pray, listen to God, and do what he says, period. That's how I've always led this church. That's how I'll always continue to lead this church. So Dr. James Dobson, America's family pastor, founder of Focus on the Family, He's spoken to millions of people. He's an incredible author, authored 37 books. He tells the story of how years ago, him and six of his buddies went skiing in Colorado at a premier skiing run. The last day that they were there, they woke up that morning and it was cloudy and overcast. The wind was whipping everywhere. It was freezing cold, a horrible day to go skiing. But that night... This beautiful, fresh powder coated the mountain. Well, two of these guys woke up and they said, come on, guys, let's go take the mountain. Dr. Dobson and the four other guys said, nah, we're going to sit here cozy around the fire. Well, these two guys went out, and within 45 minutes, the sky turned blue, the sun came out, the wind stopped, there wasn't a single skier on the slopes, like perfect conditions for skiing. These two guys came back in, they're like, man, alive, did we just have the greatest time? While you guys were all sitting there cozy around the fire, we just had the adventure of our life. And I'm going to tell you this, everybody, we can sit cozy around the fire, we can celebrate where we've come to and what God has accomplished in and through us. It'd be really easy to put this thing in neutral. But I do not believe that is in keeping with the mission and mandate of Jesus. Let me tell you something. If you think that our church is getting too big, then your love for people is way too small. Because if there are people that are away from God, 14%, 14%. God did not give us a small commission. He gave us the great commission. And so I close today with this statement from, from Francis Drake. He said, disturb us, Lord, when we are well too pleased with ourselves. When our dreams have come true because we have dreamed too little. When we have arrived safely because we've sailed too close to the shore. Come on, right where you're at, would you just bow your heads? Holy Spirit, I pray that you would come and touch our hearts afresh and anew today. In Jesus' mighty name.